grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you would open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 108. Psalm 108 is a psalm of David and not of David. It is one of those psalms, like several others, that appear somewhere else. Psalm 108 is made up of the endings of both Psalm 57 and Psalm 60. Both 57 and 60, David is in a difficult situation, and the difficult situation and a cry for help is made in the first part of 57 and 60. And then in the last part, God is praised and promises are revealed. And so what this author did was took the promises revealed part of 57 and 60, combined them into one Psalm 108. Psalm 57 is when David was hiding in a cave from Saul. Psalm 60 is when David's army were fighting against the Edomites and being successful. And so the question has to be, David, it would be dumb for David to take two previous psalms, cut them up and put them together into one. And so David did not assemble this psalm, it is believed. The words are his, But the order of the words, or when this was assembled and put in the book of Psalms, that is not David. And so, a psalm of David is actually two psalms of David squished together. It is still, of course, inspired by God. It is still the Word of God. And so, we can ask the question, why was this done, or when was this done? There are two camps on this, two views The last part of this in verse 10, it says, Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? So perhaps this was put together uh, after Edom came back. David was successful in wiping out the fortified cities of Edom and expanding the kingdom of David, which will become the throne of Christ. But after the split of the kingdom, and after some problems and rebellion, God raised up the Edomites again. And it's possible that during that fight, this was brought together. The more popular view is that this was assembled after people came back from Babylon. After people came back from Babylon, Israel was being rebooted. They were starting all over. There was no infrastructure. There was nothing They had to start over, and so praising God for his conquests, for his goodness, for his promises, that would fit quite well. One commentator said, the hopes of conquest in the second part, the consciousness that while much has been achieved by God's help, much still remains to be won before Israel can sit secure, the bar or two in the minor key, In verse 11, which heightens the exaltation of the rest of the psalm and the cry for help against adversaries too strong for Israel's unassisted might are all appropriate for the early stages of the return. So you can read Ezra and Nehemiah and people would basically attack the building of the wall and the temple and, and, and criticize them and The story that I was told when I was a wee tot of laying bricks with one hand and having a sword in the other hand is out of the book of Nehemiah. They did that to protect what they were building and God rewarded them for that. And so it was during that time as they could look out at the massive amounts of armies and people and non-Jewish people that were living in the promised land and how they were encroaching upon this fledgling, rebuilding city, crying out to God and say, but you promised, and in verse 7, that's where it is. God has promised in His holiness, you promised. Why not come and help us during this time? And so there are uh, three or four basic sections. It praises God in the first part. Then there's prayers for deliverance, and then Edom comes at the end, and then the conclusion. 
And so he begins by saying, I will sing and make melody with my being. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to you among the nations. David was probably a morning person because he got up in the wee hours of the morning to praise God. I know people like that. I am not a morning person. Some people have said, well, you got to have a, a quiet time first thing in the morning. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but I have a quiet time. Sometimes it's in the afternoon. Uh, sometimes I just don't wake up with the energy to pull it off, and I want to be able to function. However, I do keep God on my mind. I do pray first thing in the morning to set a tone for the day, just the studying may not be first thing in the morning. Some people may say, well, if I can't do it in the morning, I'm not going to do it at all. That's not the right attitude. You got to be in God's Word every day. You got to be in people who knew God's Word, who wrote about God's Word, and in God's Word and in prayer every day, whether it be morning, noon, or night. Some people I know will do it before they go to bed because it will set their their night thoughts and their dreams perhaps, and they feel they will wake up in the graces of God. You just have to do it. And so in 5 through 9, it is prayers for deliverance. And if we read through this, we can get uh, city names and town names. And it's kind of convincing how it's put together. Because when you have Sechem and you have Succoth, these are Jacob-level sort of towns. Laban, if you remember... Jacob went to Laban and worked for two decades to get two daughters. And he lived, Laban lived in Sechem, and that's where Jacob worked. Then when he finally got free from Laban and took his massive wealth to meet his brother Esau, he ended up settling after that exchange took place in the valley of Succoth. If you look at a map of the Middle East, you have the Jordan River running right down the middle of the Jordan River Valley. And on one side is Sechem, and the other side is Succoth. And so it is believed that what is being said here is the boundaries of the Promised Land, even back with Jacob, that you have, as far as the east is from the west sort of idea of these two cities and everything in between, is promised by God. And when was that promised by God? That was promised way back with Abraham, back in the book of Genesis. Abraham was a pagan. He was involved in human sacrifices. He did not know the one true living God. He was ignorant about how things came about. He was an idol worshiper. He worshipped false gods, and God said, Hey, I'm over here, and Abraham said, All right, and started following him. And during his life, God took Abraham up to the top of a mountain and said, Everything you can see, all this land, the better part of the Middle East, all you see will belong to your descendants. That is where he is going to put his people. God told Abraham, and then that promise was continued with Isaac, and that promise was continued with Jacob. God appeared to Jacob a couple of times, changed his name to Israel, and said, I'm going to give your descendants, your 12 sons, your 12 tribes, that land that I promised Abraham so long ago. And so when a when a land sort of promise like this psalm comes into being and we read it, it is a promise that goes all the way back to Abraham. And so when we look at the names, we see people, let's see, Gilead, Manasseh, Ephraim, Judah. These are tribes. These are people that became out of Jacob. They are the sons of Israel that took the promised land, and the promised land was taken under Joshua. Joshua was the one that led the tribes into the promised land, 
fought and destroyed the cities, took the land that was given by God. And then from David, when he finally became king, he finished the conquest. And it says in the Bible that when David had fully claimed the promised land, the land rested from war for the first time since, like, Abraham. And so you have Manasseh and Ephraim in the Bible. Manasseh and Ephraim were sons of Joseph. Joseph goes into Egypt. He has two sons, and those are grafted into, as it were, the 12 tribes of Israel. Ephraim is always a sign of strength when the promised land was given and the tribes moved in. Ephraim was the largest until the Assyrians came and watched, wiped them out. And so it is always seen as, as strength or size or a fulfillment of the promise when Ephraim is thrown out as a name. Moab, Moab was a son of Lot. Lot leaves Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife turns around, gets turned into a pillar of salt. Another great story of my childhood. But it's right there in the Bible. Lot had two daughters. There were no men anywhere because God blew them all up and blown up the cities. So they had relations with their father and one of them had Moab. And the Moabites were a group of people that came out of that. They were an enemy of Israel. Israel had to fight the Moabites and take the land from the Moabites during the uh, promised land. Edom. Edom is the people that followed Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. Jacob stole the birthright. He became God's chosen and Esau got mad. And so Esau married, I think, a Moabite woman. He married some foreign lady, not a Jew lady. And from that, they became against Israel. They became very powerful. And when David was claiming the promised land, there were a lot of great battles with Edom, the descendants of Esau, and then Philistia, I will shout my triumph, Philistia is where the Philistines lived, Goliath was a Philistine, they were wiped out during the taking of the promised land and eventually totally wiped out by David. There are no Philistines that exist today because they were all wiped out. Something to note in verse 9, upon Edom I will cast my shoe. I don't know if you remember when George Bush went to the Middle East and he was giving a talk. Somebody threw a shoe at him. That is an ancient, 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 ancient curse that exists here in the psalm. That if you throw a shoe at somebody, that is the lowest form of insult you can give somebody. Because your shoes are nasty and dirty. I mean, they didn't have dress shoes back then. They walked in all sorts of stuff. And so when you took off your shoe and threw it at somebody or showed the sole of your shoe as somebody, that was considered a fantastic, over-the-top, can't-beat-it insult. Worst insult you can give somebody. And so that is what is going on here is that Edom is going to be put down, is that David, who wrote these words originally, hates Edom, hates the descendants of Esau because they're taking what God has for the promised land. They're taking what God has given the Jewish people. And if you read the minor prophets like Malachi, it is a story of the advancement of God's people and the destruction of Edom. God, uh, Edom will be fully and completely destroyed at the end of time, Edom has become, in the, in the New Testament, sort of a, a metaphor of, of evil that is against God's people, is that we can look at the, the advancement of sinful behaviors and we can biblically say that that is the spirit of Edom, that that is coming out of Edom, that is coming out of Esau, who fought against God when God chose Jacob instead of Esau saying, 
I will follow God. He did everything in his life to fight him and to fight God. And Edom continues to this day. There will be something in the future about Edom and we will look at that in a second. So the idea here is there is a promise. There is a promise on the table and the promise is for land. And if we look at this, we say, oh, I don't have a promise for land. God hasn't promised me you know, 20 acres in San Lorenzo. Is there 20 acres in San Lorenzo? 20 acres in San Lorenzo to do things. So, so what's the whoopee doopy? I mean, what do I do with this verse? Well, first and foremost, it is a statement that God keeps his promises. There are centuries between God taking Abraham up to the top of the mountain and pointing to a piece of land, and when David took the land finally and completely, Joshua started, David finished it, and there are, you can look back and say, wow, that's, you know, that's this much of the Bible between that promise and this psalm. And that should tell us one thing, that when God promises something, when God promises you something, when God promises anybody something, he's not going to forget. He is going to advance his program to fulfill that promise. We are much more apt to forget what God has promised us than God has. God's fulfillment of his promise is not dependent upon our righteousness to receive it. And so when we look at the Bible, we say, well, what are the promises that we have? What are the promises that we have as Christians? We aren't promised land, but we're promised, in a way, a future land. We are, in every part of the New Testament, promised the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he's going to take his own new promised land, which is heaven, which is the new heaven and the new earth. And we look toward that. I can't really go there today. I can't visit it. You know, I would say there's no brochure, but the Bible is the brochure for heaven. There's nobody who can move me into it in a moral way. Currently, I have to wait for Jesus Christ to come and get me. And every Day, whether I am bothered by the news or whether I feel I have corona or whether I can't afford my house payment or whether I get fired from my job or all the stuff that happens normally and is advanced today more than ever, all that stuff, Satan designs it the way that it is given to you so that you will Look to the promises of God and say, that can't be true. Everything you hear on the news, everything that you get in the mail about the November election, which is so far away, but yet I'm still getting stuff in the mail about it today. All this stuff that we're getting is meant to say, God doesn't have an answer, this person does. God doesn't have an answer, this regulation does. God doesn't have an answer. This scientist, medical professional, politician has the answer because God's promises, well, you know, he gave them a really long time ago. If we look at the calendar, Jesus said he was going to come back about 2,000 years ago. And he hasn't come back yet, so he must not have really meant it. That is the view that is being promoted. But as this is given to us is that even thousand years after he talked to Moses, the Jews are still saying, hey, got a promise here. You're going to give us the promised land. And if you look at Netanyahu or whoever's in charge of, of Israel today, they do press conferences. Almost every press conference, they talk about the promised land. They talk about what God has given them. It is still a thing. It is still a promise. All this time later, there are people on this earth who believe what God said to Abraham is going to come to pass. And there needs to be people on this earth 
who listen to what Jesus said about his coming again and about the future judgment and all the parables about God's judgment and foolish people and people who don't listen, all those teachings are something that we hold dear because we know that Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow, could come back in another thousand years. We don't think so. It looks really close, but it's looked really close for a long time. Jesus Christ is coming back, and our promised land is the new heaven. And so, this ends with, with Edom. And if you, if you look at this, he says, I will, My heart is steadfast, O God. David is saying his heart is steadfast. Is David bringing up some sort of internal strength by the force of his will, making his heart steadfast? He says, for your steadfast love, in verse 4. And so our strength, our steadfastness, our ability to stand for Christ in any situation does not come because we're such good people or we're such strong people. It comes because God is a strong God. It comes because God has put His Spirit into you. And so, let's say I have a difficult thing going on, that there is some problem. I can actually, honest and truthfully, pray for it. I can pray for wisdom, I can pray for a fix, I can pray for a healing. Uh, Some time ago, in the last two, three months, my brother had a, he lost his job at the stadium, he got another job, there was difficulty with the rental, and somebody said, well, there's a house for sale, and it seemed all upside down and not knowing what to go next. It seemed like it was the perfect job to work at a baseball stadium, because my brother loves baseball. But it didn't last, because Corona broke baseball. And through it all, these doors began to open, little ones, little ones, little ones. And today they're in a house they own that they were able to buy with a deck out the back and basically an acre backyard, huge backyard. And for the first time, They feel stable, and they feel where God was bringing them because their house payment was half their rent. So they're now saving all sorts of money, and they have a place that they can call their own. And he has a job that he loves, managing a building now, a 44-story building. Uh, And he has a home to go to that he knows is going to be there. Now, is this the end of the chapter? No, it's not the end of the chapter for any of us. God is still working in his heart. God is still working in my heart. And God is still working in your heart. But there can be a confidence to pray for what you want. There can be a strength to pray for God to do something. We're not just rolling the dice and say, God, do whatever you want. I can actually look at my situation and say, hey, I want healing. And the Bible talks about healing. I'm going to pray about healing. I want financial stability. And the Bible talks about financial stability. And I can pray about that. Am I guaranteed everything I want? No, because I have sinful desires And I want to, as James says, spend things on myself instead of for the glory of God. But as I pray through these things, I have a confidence. I have a strength, and I have a strength because of Jesus Christ. This psalm, as I said, ends with Edom. There's a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 63, we spent a lot of time in Isaiah 53. But Isaiah 63 says this, Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bozrah? He is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads the winepress? 
I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. So Isaiah had a vision of some mighty warrior stained with his enemy's blood coming out of Edom. Of course, because we have the rest of the Bible, we know that that is none other than Jesus Christ. Is that Jesus Christ, with Edom being the representation of all that is against God in the world, Jesus Christ is going to go into Edom and wipe it out and be stained with the enemy's blood. It says in the book of Revelation, when Jesus Christ comes on a white horse, he will be wearing a white robe, and the white robe will be stained with blood. And we know if we keep looking through Revelation, if we look in Isaiah, if we look at some other places, it's not his blood. You're not going to beat Jesus. It is the blood of his enemies. And the fact that his that their blood flows, as it were. Jesus Christ, as one bumper sticker I saw the other day said, Jesus Christ is coming again, and boy is he mad. Jesus Christ will come back to make all things right. And today, if we look at that promise and we say, I believe, I trust in the warrior that comes out of Edom, and I put my trust in Jesus Christ, then I can look at these passages, I can look at this psalm, and I can say, yeah, God's going to win, and I won't have any fear, because I'm on His side. I think it's weird when we say, God's on my side. No, I'm on His side. He's the one that has the winning side, and I'm following Him. And wherever he goes and wherever he takes me and wherever he puts me to live and whatever job he puts me into and whatever things he shows me and whatever things in my life that he breaks and he, he prunes and he removes to make me more like him, whatever these things are, I will praise God. I will glory in what he is doing because I am on his side because he is from picking Abraham out of nothing. He picked Abraham out of the Ur, the Chaldees. The Chaldeans became the Babylonians. The Babylonians were ruthless people, and God judged them for that. That's what Abraham was, and God said, I pick you. And from that picking, he has created a people unique to him who follow him. And at the end of time... All of Edom, all that is against God will be destroyed and all who follow him, all who are of Abraham and Jacob will be taken into the promised land. This is what God is doing. This is what Jesus Christ will do and this is our confidence and our strength. I can pray in the morning or the noon or the evening with confidence and strength not because of who I am, but because of who God is and because of what he has done for me. His promises for me are clear in Scripture as they are for you. And I believe them and I hold God to them, but I don't have to because God always keeps his promises. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are the warrior who comes out of Edom with no evil left, that at the end of time you are going to valiantly defend your honor and your truth. Lord, I praise you for that. And I pray that we as individuals and as a church may be willing to stand for truth, to stand with confidence in all that you have said. Lord, we praise you for this. And as your blessing upon the remainder of the day, we ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen.